Now, uh, I would like to call upon the keynote speaker, Professor Stephen Billiard, uh, Adult and Vocational Education at Great University, Australia. I welcome you, sir, for your keynote speech. is important, 
that action at the local level is most important and that these are essential for achieving those purposes. Now while I work through this presentation, you might like to consider two questions. The firstly is, what is currently occurring in your country associated with these purposes? And then secondly, what needs to happen for them to be achieved? So you might want to think about those as issues, i.e. the what is, what is currently occurring, but also what should be, what needs to happen in the future. Now if we look at the purposes of vocational education, mm -hmm. I would propose that there's, in the contemporary era, there is probably five that are very important. John Dewey, in Democracy in Education, chapter 23, and if you haven't read it, please read it. He suggested that there were two purposes for education for occupations. The first one was to assist people identify the occupations to which they were suited. Dewey argued that if an individual couldn't find their vocation, their calling, they were left and threatened with engaging in a life of un uncongenial calling, which would be of little interest to them, and so perhaps a life not well spent. Dewey then went on to say that the second goal was for these young people to be prepared adequately to practice that occupation. Now we do a lot of this, this second one, this is the key focus of much of TVET systems, and perhaps we don't do enough with that first goal. The other point that um, if Dewey, if he lived longer, great visionary man, he didn't actually coin the term vocational education, but Dewey really gave substance to the concepts and dignity to the concept of vocational education, I would argue. And that we now know that initial occupation preparation is insufficient for a, a lifetime of employment and employability. And so we need then to have provisions for continuing education and training. The fourth purpose has arisen, and it's been mentioned here, but it's a, it's a global issue. And that is, in an era of high aspiration, vocational education is seen as being low status and often an option only for those who have no other options. And this is becoming a structural and systemic problem globally in both countries with developed and developing economies. So we can't ignore this problem. We actually have to take action to try and engage young people in vocational education. And the, the fifth goal I want to refer to is the importance of initiating and enacting innovation. Now in March 2020, with the beginning of the pandemic, COVID pandemic, where boards were closed, this device here became quite common for everybody. In Australia, a country that cut itself off from the rest of the world, <coughs> We had one company in a small regional town producing these. They had four machines and one of them wasn't one of them wasn't working. A population of 26 million people. We had no production ability for PPE, personal protective equipment for our health workers. And guess where the fabric comes from? China. You said it, I didn't. So, the question there is, the question that's been resonating in my country, Australia, is how can we become far more self-reliant and self-sufficient, particularly in an era of rising global tensions? So this has become an important issue. So, these are the points here is, sorry, the point here is that without adequate engagement by numbers and kinds of students, VET's future is perilous. We can't get the students, it's not going to be sufficient. And the personal and institutional investments will be squandered if young people fail to find their occupations. Currently, in my country, um, less than 50% of apprentices complete their apprenticeship. And then for females, young females, that 
a very, a very large portion of them do hairdressing apprenticeships and at the end of the apprenticeship leave the occupation in droves, in, in large numbers, sorry. And however, it's the same thing for nursing. Large numbers of novice nurses leave the occupation because the ideals, what they imagine the work to be, isn't the case. So we need to inform and engage people so that, to prepare them so they don't leave. And that initial occupational preparation needs to secure adaptability. It's not just a question of being able to perform particular predetermined outcomes, particularly if they're behavioural, but rather that have the capacity to um, address new problems. Now, when I was working as a vocational educator in fashion, would you believe, yes, it's hard to believe, isn't it, that our students, you couldn't teach the students to make the fashions that are in the shop today, because by the time they graduated, guess what would happen? Those garments would be in the second hand store. So what we had to do with our students was provide them with informed principles and practices that they could apply to different kinds of garments that would come up in the future. And so that was fundamental to our educational process. And that um, TV, uh, CET provisions um, can be aligned with uh, working age adults need and support innovations at work. Uh, which is essential both for their employability and also for workplace viability. The, simple, very, the very simple proposition is that when you have an innovation in the workplace, um, it inevitably involves workers learning. If that innovation comes from outside the workplace, the workers inevitably have to work out how it can function effectively in the workplace. And then lots of innovations actually occur in the work settings when problems are identified and solutions generated. And recently I've completed two studies in Singapore looking at SMEs, small to medium sized enterprises, looking at innovation and learning. So this is a great opportunity, not only for workplace innovation, but also to provide a grounded approach to continuing education and training for the workforce. Okay, so I'm going to go through these five focuses or purposes of TVET. The first one is um, enhancing engagement in VET as a worthwhile educational sector. And as you know, across countries with both developed and developing economies, the standing of vocational education is low. I've done work for UNESCO, and I was astonished in some of the countries where because of high aspirations that vocational education was seen as being not a preferred occupation. The problem here appears to be that aspiration, which is wonderful, we want our students to aspire to the best they can. However, when aspiration translates into expectations, that is where the difficulties occur. So this leads to structural problems in developing occupational capacities, in communities and enterprises and the difficulties of realising um, national, social and economic goals. In Australia, recently, I got to see a medical specialist within a week. In May of this, April of this year, we had a storm which took out one of the windows in my house. I was able to get that, the window repaired last week, just before I came on this trip. I, I've given up trying to get skilled workers to come and work on my wooden house. They're, they're just not available. Um, so in an era of high aspiration, that is often seen, as I've mentioned, as being an option only for those with no choice. And this has consequences. Governments, employers, educational systems view it as low priority, scant and ad hoc funding is arri arrives. I, know, I did a review once on how frequent the duration of the minister in charge of vocational education in Australia. Guess how long? Nine months was the average in that role. How can somebody learn about the field and make decisions? Because it's not seen as being a good career trajectory for ambitious politicians. 
Um, so it's not attracting the sufficient kinds and caliber of young people we need. And um, so engaging young people, their parents and caregivers, as well as workplaces and communities, seems to be an important issue for vocational education. So how do we go about doing this? Well, I've conducted some studies both within Australia and um, for UNESCO across a range of countries in developing economies. And some of the things that have come out, practical actions, appear as follows. That there's things that have to happen at the national level. A lot of that is about the championing of vocational education by government, but also by industry and professional bodies, that they need to take the responsibility for saying to young people, their parents, that these occupations are worthwhile. One of the reasons that has to happen is because if vocational education institutions try and promote the occupations, it's seen as marketing, it's seen as building a means by which these institutions will get students. So we have to go back and say, this is the role to keep national bodies, employers and government to champion it. At the local level, schools, um, I think it's important that they provide impartial advice about vocational education because much of the privileging is getting young people into university and to also provide experiences such as, such as visits to, to vet institutions and to engage people who can inform young people directly about those occupations. And locally, Skips. I'm sure Nick Jagger doesn't have to do this. Yes, so importantly, local partnerships amongst government, um, local enterprises need to support that development. So the whole thing about social partnerships, local social partnerships, um, is, 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 is important. And for schools in particular, it's important that they are able to go beyond the bounds of the school, go beyond the bounds of the school fence and engage with the community outside of the school fence. Okay, and so sorry, and also then to provide work experiences and things like open days when people can go to large enterprises, healthcare settings, to actually see what the work is. So I'll give you a case study. This is a case study of a project called the Health to Employment, Health Education to Employment Pathways. Thank you. Um, health to Employment Education Pathways. So this was a project that's about getting young people into allied health roles because we have a crisis in young people and people being employed in that sector, particularly in aged care. So this was a project funded by the local health department and it involved a particular focus on young indigenous people, that's Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, and what would engage and attract them to these occupations. And what I present now is what these young people told us. And it's very similar to what uh, Professor Redhold was saying earlier. And they said they want engaging conditions stable work, and employment opportunities, good pay, and the opportunity, young people, to make friends. And they wanted engaging work, the work that was inspiring, caring, compassionate, and that they often found about it, out about it through their families. And they wanted to help their communities, and they wanted to learn new skills, and engage in diverse workforce. And, um, so, but they also wanted support, opportunities, tasters. Tasters are the opportunities to actually trial <coughs> occupations to see if they're like, they're like them. We used to have this process called pre-vocational programs that young people could trial different kinds of occupations to see if they like them. Cadetships and also, um, they also wanted engaging education. 
educational experiences which provide them with applicable outcomes and understandings and importantly certification. What was underpinning of this, um, one of these issues was the importance of localised support and localised engagement. Now many of these young indigenous people, they only, their only contact with healthcare systems is doctors and nurses. And so that's all they can see. And there's this idea that if you can't see it, you can't be it. So the idea then was to provide experiences so these young people could go into hospitals and see the entire range of occupations that are occurring in those hospitals and, and to open up, open up the array of ex possible occupations for them. And one thing that occurred to me after completing this study is that what was being suggested here for these young indigenous people was probably applicable across the broader Australian youth population because lots of those people would have had limited experiences. So the second purpose then is how we assist young people identify occupations to which they're suited. And this has been a key focus. And the goal really is for young people to, um, uh, to identify their vocation. And the difference between an occupation and a vocation is that an occupation is developed through society. Occupations are cultural practices. We need people to cut our hair, to care for us when we're sick, to cook food for us, etc., etc. But vocations are a personal fact. You can't tell somebody this is their vocation. People actually have to experience and come to commit themselves to um, a vocation. So what our role is to provide experiences to help people find an occupation to which they're suited so that it becomes their vocation. Because when something's your vocation, that is something you will invest time and effort in doing a good job, but also invest in effort in maintaining your skills because you have pride in what you're doing. I come from Britain and there was this concept about called pride of trade. It was the pride you would take in your work. Believe it or not, at the beginning of my working life in a large factory in Lancashire, um, the head cutters would come in in the morning they would wear a bowler hat and they would have gloves. And they would ceremoniously in the morning take off their bowler hat, take off their gloves, put their gloves in the bowler hat, then put on a work jacket and commence their day's work. So they were really proud of the work that they did. And that's something that's important for us to achieve. Young people at the moment perhaps are making some ill-founded and uninformed decisions. And this can lead to low retentions in, in initial occupations, as I've mentioned, high attrition rates in apprenticeship and occupations like nursing. So many young women, for instance, and it is lots of young women, want to do nursing because they think, this is nice work, I will help sick people, and I will be a nice person. And then they find themselves changing the diapers of an 84-year-old male who's got delirium or dementia and they're confronted with the reality of, of nursing work. And so the other situation is that young people can end up doing quite long and circuitous pathways to employment. And if certainly for in, in my country where young people pay for their edu higher education through a debt, young people are accruing enormous debts. My daughter entered working life with a $34,000 debt that she has to pay off as a young person. And so also engaging and persisting in work that you don't like is not the recipe for a happy adult life, I don't think. So, so such choices have consequences and what we know that in certain countries, for, so for instance in my country I've said that skilled workers are hard to come by, but also there's concerns from Britain about post-Brexit and the way that the technical skills and the technical workers needed in that economy simply aren't available. And then Thomas Diesinger has reported from Germany that there is a war for apprentices, that companies are competing with each other to try and secure
Carpo de Dama. Tá? So, so young people are probably going to need support and guidance. It's okay. Um, support and guidance in identifying the occupations they're suited to and that are aligned with their interests. So it's important then we, we provide this and try and find um, ways of doing it. And from the work I've been doing, it seems that this has to happen at the local level. Young people are often bombarded with information about different occupations, but what is missing is for them to understand it, how that information relates to them, their capacities, their interests and their career goals. And so it needs to occur locally. One of the interesting things that came out of the research was there were clear differences in the understandings that young people had about the range of occupations in rural and regional communities than metropolitan communities. And I think that's because in regional and rural communities, those occupations are very evident. You can see them, you can observe them. And I think that's less the case in, in metropolitan communities. Um, so, um, as I'm saying again, understanding about their interests, um, how these translate into potential occupations can only be understood at the local level. So here's some specific strategies that might be helpful. What we found that the social partnerships in which schools engage with local tertiary education institutions and employers provide experiences that help inform post-school pathways. Teachers do a great job. School teachers do a wonderful job, but most of the school teachers I've interviewed concede that they do not know much about working life other than being a teacher. And so we have to find ways of influencing um, young people because teachers' influence is very powerful. That, that's consistent in the work we've done, but also in global studies. So op opportunities such as pre-vocational programs where young people can trial different occupations, Tasters, where they can have small opportunities to engage with them. Local visit to local vet institutions and enterprises by students. And also the teachers. The teachers need to go along to those meetings as well. Because the teachers are often deficit in their knowledge of working life and those options. And so this requires then issues of local engagement. And the examples I've seen where this works best is actually in rural communities and regional communities and then there's the need to make a workplace experiences organized so that young people have those experiences okay so the third purpose then is the classic one for vocational education which is initial occupational preparation and indeed the traditional role of vocational education is to prepare people for occupations However, in recent times, the governmental rhetoric has changed, and that is it's now suggesting that young graduates need to be job ready. Now that's a very tough educational goal, because we don't know where the graduate's going to end up, do we? So it's one thing addressing a set of industry competences, but how do we prepare young people for a particular job when we don't know how they're going to get it? Um, so there's a gap there between governmental rhetoric and the kind of educational processes you need to achieve that, which really are about developing adaptability as well as occupational Hola. And, okay, all right. You okay? <laughs> hello, hello. Yeah. So, yeah, so the point there is that if we don't know the circumstances that's required for that employment, it's a bit hard to know how to prepare them for it. And there's clearly different educational processes and objectives in preparing people to be job ready than occupational preparation. There's also now this requirement for the, so, sorry, the, the 21st century skills, of complex problem solving, critical thinking, people management and coordination. Now, if you look at those, those qualities there, we all know that you can't... <laughs> Sorry for the inconvenience. <laughs> what you 
know is in that list of things there, you can't teach them, can you? You can't teach them. They have to be learned. So how do we provide the experiences that develop those kind of capacities? <laughs> I'm going to do it as well. The important thing is that vet graduates then need to have experiences of workplaces, but what they also need after that is the ability to, to share and compare and contrast other kinds of work experiences. So that when young people can get together and they can talk about the way that a particular occupation is practiced in workplace A, B, C and D. And this I refer to as post-practicum engagements, where once the students have had those experiences, they can come together. Ah, okay. And um, so developing these capacities seems to be important, and the workplace is at the front of this. I'll go through this quickly. I do a lot of work in how people learn through work. I don't need to rehearse this here for you. What the, con the concerns is that, is that when you engage in workplace activities, you're engaging in goal-directed activities, which is about learning, and that the kind of thinking and acting you're doing is associated with achieving those goals, and that's how you learn. But more than that, workplaces are richly contextual, and that is so important for the indexation of knowledge, how we recall and use knowledge. And so that's what that list is about there. Um, the, in terms of enriching workplace experiences, it's important to think about workplaces differently than education institutions, because they aren't the same. So we need to think about models of workplace curriculum, which come from anthropology and how people learned before we had schools and colleges and universities. And then we need to think about the pedagogic practices that are effective in workplaces. And again, these are very different than those that occur within schools. So you have a set of pedagogic practices that are germane, sorry, that are relevant to work settings. And then importantly, it's how young people, or not so young people, come to engage the, the, the personal epistemologies Long word, sorry about that, about how people come to engage. Now what I've provided in the, um, for you, it comes through with a PDF, is this brochure here, which comes from the research work I've been doing. And you'll see one table provides a set of models of workplace curriculum. You'll see that table two has a set of pedagogic practices that um, are, are applicable to work, and you'll see there's a description of the pedagogic practice, its kind of use and the kind of knowledge that's been learned from it. And then th the third table covers the personal epistemological practices of, well, I should say the personal practices of the learners and how the learners need to actively engage. So that's there for you, there's a resource, and that stuff comes from research processes that look at how learning occurs in the workplace. So how do we enrich um, learning experiences um, for our students? Also, as I've mentioned, it's very important that we bring the workplace experiences back into the educational programs. And I've been doing this work on providing and integrating workplace experiences. And one of the considerations is the kind of curriculum practice that you use, what's intended and active and experienced, Again, pedagogic practices associated with integrating the two sets of experiences and then personal practices. Now the important thing about the personal practices there is that it's the students who have that experience and they need to bring it in and reconcile it. Also attached to your, um, your information is this research bulletin from a project which talks about how you can integrate this experiences that students have in the, um, practice, in, the, in the practice settings. And this has come from work in higher education, but it's, it's e equally applicable, I think, to, um, uh, to vocational education. Okay. So, um, let's...
Then the fourth purpose then is continuing education and training. So what we know now is that the initial occupational preparation we have is insufficient for lengthening working lives and that given all the changes that are going on in occupational practice and workplace requirements, clearly that knowledge has to change. This was brought home to me some years ago when I was talking to a very senior medical clinician. And I said to him um, that I'm sure the fundamentals of medical knowledge hasn't changed since he was a, a graduate. And he said, not at all. He said nearly all of the foundational knowledge he learned as a doctor about human physiology has changed. So it's not just the canonical elements of the occupation that change, but all of the practices and processes with it. So this suggests then that we need to constantly learn across some uh, uh, working life to sustain individuals' employability and also to support the viability of workplaces. And so VET then needs to play this key role in continuing education and training. And this means, I think, going largely beyond the provision of taught courses and finding other ways that um, learning can occur. The problem with taught courses, of course, is that you have to transfer the knowledge that you've learned to another situation. And we all know that far transfer doesn't always work. So anything that you can do within the work setting to develop that knowledge obviates the need, sorry, avoids the need for, um, um, for that transfer. So there's different um, approaches to um, continuing education and training and some important considerations. Adults aren't like young people attending tertiary education. Adults also have three other lives apart from being a student. They often have a family life, more likely a work life, and they often have commitment to community. So for instance, I've done work in Singapore, and there um, it's, it was, you know, most Singaporeans have commitments on the weekends to their children's education, or strong commitments to church and other community activities. So we need to find ways of engaging. I describe the contemporary students as not being time poor, but being time jealous. There's a difference in this, and that is time poor is, I don't have enough time. Time jealousy is, I have to use my time strategically. I have to make choices about what I do and what I don't do. And that pertains as much to adults who have all these other commitments, as young people who are trying to manage a social life and a part-time work life, etc. So we need to really focus on time jealous students. And so for instance, asking working age adults perhaps to go to a polytechnic in Singapore two nights a week for a three hour session where the lecturer talks at you isn't probably the most effective way of engaging with them. They want to talk to, to each other. So, um, yeah, so we need to bring in work experiences. We need to try and ensure that the, the experiences that are provided are, are relevant and engaging. And of course, bringing in students' experience um, can uh, get a long way to achieving that. So, we need to think then in terms of going beyond classroom based activities, work based projects, group activities, professional clusters, all those sorts of things. And that teachers, um, although we like to think we're our experts, and I guess I'm doing that here now, we also need to become, you know, using students' contributions, understanding students' needs, and engaging with them, and then linking uh, to workplace experiences and wherever possible workplace innovations. And but all of this needs to be understood locally, um, so that working age. Adults have relevant experiences and that these can achieve the kind of goals that they need, but also their employment demands of them. So, um, so yes, so it's um, important that CET educators are sensitive to, those, sensitive to those needs and have occupational expertise themselves as well as educational expertise. Okay, and then finally, to this new goal, I think, um, about initiating and enacting 
workplace innovations. That because of these changing needs which I've referred to, it's important that the active role of uh, uh, workers engaging in workplaces and supporting innovations. And this seems to be yeah, a, a, a very important goal for us going forward. And I'm sure Nepal and the other countries you come from are no different than the country I live in, which is looking to be more self-sufficient and self-directed. Uh, uh, self-sufficient, sorry. Um, so these um, innovations are central to meeting local communities' needs and also so local social goals, but collectively to achieving the social and economic goals of nations. So, um, workplace innovations um, are unlikely to be initiated or even adopted without engaging workers' capacities and learning. There's, I don't know if you're familiar with the theorization around change, lots of different theories, but one of the concepts I use is what James Versch refers to as the difference between appropriation and mastery. Mastery is when somebody takes something on but they don't believe in it. And while the boss is watching them, they might do it, but as soon as the boss is gone, they don't do it. Whereas appropriation is somebody believing it's important and will do it when the boss isn't there. With teachers, for instance, many of you are involved in teaching, what we know in terms of teacher change is that unless the teacher develops the capacities to um, um, successfully implement the innovation, as soon as the funding stops, they stop doing it. So the developing of the ability to, to achieve those outcomes seems to be important. So um, vet provisions then need to contribute directly to the development of communities including its public and private sector enterprises. This is not just about profitability, this is about the quality of aged care, this is about the quality of what happens in the hospitals and what doctors and others do. Um, so it's more than individual development, it's about responding to the needs and services within those communities and how these can be realised, I think, is what to me seems really obvious and that is all these changes that go on in the workplace, you know, by engaging workers within those, their, their learning arises. From the Singapore study, what I was able to do is identify three different kinds of change. Strategic change, where the company changed its focus and what it does. Um, um, production. Um, productive changes, which is about the changing of how the, the, the business operates. And then thirdly, procedural changes about how the minute of how the work is done. And in each of those three um, kinds of changes, there's a different zone of potential for workers to learn. And that is they, they create different levels and kinds of opportunities to work. Now this stuff happens all the time in workplaces, and yet we probably don't try and utilise those learning opportunities as much as we should. So, um, in terms of achieving these, this vision or these goals that I've been referring to, um, much of it I think is based upon localised engagement. Um, much of it is directed to engagements that can only be understood, enacted and realised at a local level and often through local partnerships. Engagement with workplaces, community at the local level and also the importance of promoting learner agency and engagement. So aligning the readiness of the learners, what they can do, what is reasonable for them to do, what sits within what Vygotsky refers to, not at the zone of, of um, proximal development, which he never referred to by the way, that's Bruno, but Vygotsky referred to the zone of potential development, the zone, the scope in which an individual could engage with their, through their own interest and excitation. And that is the zone that is important to capture. And then, failing that, or outside of that, that is when we need the zone of proximal development where you provide guidance and support. So here, the importance of guidance rather than teaching seems to be important. And that is placing the learners in the driver's seat rather than teaching them. Some years ago I did a study um, of what in Britain is referred to as FY1 and FY2 doctors. 
that are these people who are in the first and second year of medical work as doctors. Now, I'm sure you're aware that the medical curriculum in this particular program, which was in Aberdeen in Scotland, um, the last two years, the medical students spend all of their time in the hospital. Yet surprisingly, on that Monday morning, when they started practicing as doctors, they suddenly realized there was a whole pile of stuff that they didn't know. How much potassium was required for this strip? What does that concept mean? The simple problem had been, although they'd been immersed in the hospital, they hadn't actually been engaged in the clinical decision making. They'd been standing behind the person making those decisions. So it's important then we place the learners in the driver's seat to achieve that and to achieve those outcomes. I'm getting perilously close to the end of time. Okay, so in sum, how timely. Um, so advancing nations and communities' social and economic goals require more than vets being responsive to their needs. It also requires them to, be, to actively support and realise change through these key purposes. And what I've suggested at the end here, and it's interesting because this was mentioned, I think particularly in Professor Reinhardt's talk, about the importance of social infrastructure, partnerships at the local level, which help realise that, administrative structure at the local level, which requires support and guidance for those partnerships to thrive and be supported, and then finally, an education infrastructure, which is about the qualities of what teachers do, but of course the openness and engagement for education provisions to reach out and engage in the community. So thanks for that. Now, just um, I'll just say that there's, as I was, what I asked you to do was you probably didn't do it. I don't blame you. Um, was to consider the stuff that's happening in your country, um, the what is and perhaps what might be required to happen. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, the difficulties with the sound system. Thank you very much. Thank you.